Yes. Senator McDaniel, Senator McGarvey, Here. Senator Nemes, Senator Schroeder, Here. Senator Southworth, Here. Senator Storm, Senator Thayer, Here. Senator Wheeler, Here. Representative Blanton, Here. Representative Bowling, Here. Representative Cantrell, Representative Decker, Representative Duplessis, Representative Fisher, Representative Flood, Representative Gooch, Representative Graham, Representative Heath, Here. Representative Heverin, Present. Representative Heron, Representative Imes, Here. Representative Johnson, Yes, ma'am. Representative Cook, Here. Representative Derek Lewis, Representative Scott Lewis, Here. Representative Maddox, Here. Representative Mentor, Here. Representative Moser, Representative Namus, here. Representative Scott. Representative Smith. Here. Representative Stevenson. Representative Tate. Present. Representative Tipton. Here. Representative Upchurch. Here. Representative Weber. Here. Representative Wheatley. Here. Representative Bratcher. Here. Representative Miller. Here. Senator Mills. I'm here. Very good. Before we get into the uh, meat of uh, our uh, meeting here today, we have before us, and hopefully you've all taken a look at this, a, uh, a referred, I'm sorry, we have uh, the, mi the minutes first. We have minutes from our previous meeting that we need to approve. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Now we'll move on to our referred administrative regulation. And Mr. Pullum, if you could come up and give us just a very short synopsis of this uh, regulation that's before us today. All right, is that on? It is. We can All right, hear. yes. My name is Stephen Pulliam. I'm general counsel of the Executive Branch Ethics Commission. And this regulation is just to um, fulfill the requirements that the legislature put in the new KRS 11A-047. It deals with transition. Constitutional officers uh, oftentimes need transition teams. And there's a time period where you um, they're not in office, but they have people working with them to fill seats in their uh, administration, whether that's a, a governor, a, attorney general, secretary of state. And this just sets out some guidelines for them, and it allows a way for us to collect the information that we would need to determine if those people are um, doing what they should be and staying out of what they uh, shouldn't be involved in. And, um, but I, I think it's uh, the regulation looks good. LRC staff has been amazing in helping us get it to you um, in this form. So if you have any questions. Any questions from our committee for Mr. Pullum? All right, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all very much. All righty. We'll move on to uh, kind of the meat of our meeting. And next up is uh, the representatives from uh, the Secretary of State's office and the, the Board of Elections. And I'll let the ladies take their seat and introduce themselves. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for having Thank us. And the focus of our uh, meeting today is on election security and they're gonna start us off. The floor is yours. Hello, um, I'm Jennifer Sketchfield, the Assistant Secretary of State for Michael Adams. And I'm Karen Sellers, Executive Director of the State Board of Elections. If I can get the PowerPoint. Okay, um, thank you again for having us here today. As you all are well aware, we have myths and conspiracies that continue to abound about elections, and these are being promulgated by people that really should know better. Um, in the last two years, you all have helped us upgrade and um, do security improvements for our elections. Um, we've included photo ID to vote, um, cleaned up the voter rolls. If you think about it, we've had over 110,000 deceased voters uh, removed over the last two and a half years. Um, absentee ballot tracking, enhanced signature verification, ban on ba ballot harvesting, move to paper ballots, video surveillance on voting machines, and expanded audit process. Um, I think it's very important to state over and over again that the voting machines are not connected to the internet. They do not have modems within them. The internet has nothing to do with voting in Kentucky. 
Totals, um, tabulations of these voting machines occur at the precinct level. They are done by our poll workers that are both Republican and Democrat by law. Um, and there's 4,000 of these precincts. It would take a lot of fraud to occur if it was happening at all 4,000 um, locations. These results are then driven to our county clerk's offices. Um, the county clerk uses a computer not connected to the internet to consolidate these numbers. Um, once they have been completed, the election results are transferred to a brand new flash drive. One of the things we always hear on election night is unofficial results. The reality is the official results are the only ones used to certify the elections. The deviations from election night reporting and official certification um, are extremely rare. We, the, I think the only instance that I know of that unofficial results were different than the official results is when we had a write-in in 2018. And the write-ins don't appear on the, the unofficial results. Um, if you think about it this way, how many of us stay up at night on election night and watch the results come in? Unofficial results really are just for our entertainment. It is for us to get that instant gratification. Um, and I think we really need to think about it that way. Hand counting is not the most secure way to count um, ballots. Um, you know, it, our Constitution was amended in the 1940s in order to update and be able to use machines to count. The use of the machines expedites election results. You won't have results for weeks. Um, machines go through at accuracy and logic testing before every election. And I don't think everybody understands that that testing, they have to be perfect. Our vendors will discuss this as they come up and talk to you as well. Using the machine to count the vote also combats fraud. Um, after switching to the machine count in the 1940s, both the Courier Journal and the Herald Leader reported on the benefits of using the machines. You get the expedited results, the secrecy of the ballot is secured, it combats fraud, and it has a precise counter that we can count, be able to determine how many ballots went in and how many ballots were given out. You cannot stuff these ballot boxes. And you know, mentioned um, voting, uh, machines tested for accuracy. Every one of our county clerk's office has an accuracy board that meets before the election to make sure and certify the voting machines are ready to be used um, in the election. These county board of elections are comprised of Republicans, Democrats. It's bipartisan the way it should be. Um, you know, there's many safeguards that they use documenting the chain of custody. You can read it there. I'm not going to read it to you. But there are checks and balances in place to ensure that our elections are secure. Um, do, does Kentucky use paper ballots? By 2024, because of you all, we will have paper ballots statewide. Right now, we have very few counties that have not converted to paper ballots. Um, Federal funds from HAVA, as well as $25 million that you all allocated, counties um, will be up to date and ready to go by 2024. Um, another thing that you all did is expand the audit process. Obviously, Kentucky has always had audits, but it was a randomized audit process done by the Attorney General. State Board of Elections is implementing a risk limiting audit to be used after this November election. Um, this will give a random, not random, I guess, but apolitically, it will take a look and make sure that the results that we report by a percentage are correct. This allows us to expand it if we find there are any deviations. Um, the reality is the goal of the audit should be objective, non-political review. Um, I've heard lots of information, lots of people speaking about the barcodes on ballots. The barcodes are not connected to the um, voter. If you think about how many hundreds of ballot faces some of our counties have, I think, Gabe, how many ballot faces did you have? I, I would normally have about 45 to 58, like, depending mm -hmm. on what's on the ballot. Right. So, I mean, you have multiple ballots. You have some precincts that are going to have ba multiple um, ballot faces in that precinct. These barcodes just tell that scanner 
which races they're voting on. Um, without the barcodes, the counties would need separate machines for each ballot face. And I don't think we have the money to be able to support that. Um, again, I think our vendors will go over it um, in, in their testimony in a little bit. Our voting systems are designed to protect against tampering. They have rules that they follow when they're stored. They have rules that they follow for transportation and voting. They have physical and system access controls, lockable doors, tamper evidence seals, and access codes. There are so many things that the county clerks, and they hate the paperwork. Um, they're probably nodding behind me right now. Um, but there are so many things that they have to do after every election, before every election, during every election, in order to maintain the integrity of the ballot. Um, they know the number of ballots that have been given out. They have to um, complete an uh, accounting of all the ballots used. Um, they send to the State Board of Elections um, the certification of the official county, counting and record of election totals. Um, this is signed by the Republican the Democratic member, the county clerk, and the county sheriff. I think we've got a bipartisan group together on this. Um, precinct election sheriff's post-election report, this goes to the grand jury and to the county clerk. All voter um, assistance forms are provided to the grand jury. All oath of voter forms are provided to the Commonwealth attorney. The list of voters issued absentee ballots goes to the State Board of Elections. Um, the grand totals report, State Board of Elections, rejected absentee and reasons um, is sent to the State Board of Elections. Um, and finally, the County Board of Election post-election report is sent to the grand jury and the State Board of Elections. We have the safeguards in place. Um, are voting machines certified? More and more and more, yes. Um, it's a two part, actually it's really a three part process. You have the Election Assistance Commission that um, does a national certification of any election equipment that is to be used. Um, then the State Board of Elections, when a vendor comes to them, they do their own certification. I need to remind you that both the EAC and the State Board of Elections are bipartisan boards. Um, currently, Kentucky has ESNS, Heart Inner Civic, and Microvote. Um, Microvote is currently not being used, so that's why you only have HART and ESNS here. Um, but the third part is each county legislative body purchases the machines. They go through RFP processes. They go through their own checks and balances. So we have three levels of people taking a look at these machines to make sure that they are exactly what they want. Um, EAC, in order to um, certify a system, it has to have 1.5 million votes without error. Finally, when you want election information, who do you want to go to? The reality is you need to go to an election official. Go to somebody that's been a poll worker. Go to somebody that has been um, uh, working in as an administrator for elections. Go to somebody that has gone to the testing and accuracy of the voting machines. You've got to trust the trusted source. Thank you. Ms. Ellis, do you have anything to add? I will ditto everything that uh, Ms. Scutchfield said. Uh, the one thing I would like to add about the uh, testing for accuracy, that is a public, mm -hmm. it is notified public. Anyone uh, can come and observe the machines being tested for accuracy. I know the clerks uh, well publicize it. Uh, I would encourage anyone to do it coming up toward the November election if you see or call the clerk's office and it is well, you'll actually see a lot of that today, but you will know that your machines in your county are ready to be used and be accurate and provide the best security. Um, I will add, too, as well, if uh, Ms. Scutchfield doesn't mind, we have 11 counties that are not upgraded yet. So we have upgraded almost 
um, all of 120 counties. And as uh, Ms. Scutchfield said, State Board of Elections, and I think many of you are aware, we designated 6.7 million from a security fund that we're closing at our um, in our agency, plus the 25 million that um, your you all have approved, is going to go a long way to really bring the counties, the 11 counties, plus any counties that would need additional equipment or want. Um, you know, additional upgrades. So again, we are very appreciative for that opportunity to make sure our counties can provide the most secure election possible for Kentucky. Very good. We're going to take some questions, about 15 minutes of questions, and then we'll pause out of respect. We're going to make sure that our, our vendors that are here have enough time as well. But we've got several questions lining up, and uh, we'll take a few of these to begin with. Co-Chair Bratcher has a question. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Scratchfield, I, uh, Scratchfield. Scratchfield, I'm sorry. I really uh, enjoy your uh, presentation, and I agree with all of it, basically. But I got to tell you, when you started it off with people should know better than ask these questions that that didn't settle good with me because I just want to tell you there are a lot of things out there that are not settled as you might say they are because I, I can go to 10 different election lawyers on something let's say qualifications for a candidate and I'll get 10 different answers and then you got active judges out there that are just making up law on the bench constantly so let's don't come in with the attitude. This is a panel of the people of Kentucky, representative. You're basically talking to the people of Kentucky. So let's please just don't, and, and this sounds harsh, but don't take it that way. It's just, this is for all of us, including myself. Let's don't get so arrogant that we can't ask questions because that's what we're here for. And uh, once again, I agree with you on that. I think our systems are very safe and secure, and I've looked at it from all the questions. So if you want to respond, if the chairman allow you, I can see you want to respond to that. If I may, um, I, absolutely, I absolutely welcome questions. Um, the problem is sometimes we're, people are getting questions with people that don't know and they're answering them. But we welcome questions. We welcome them coming to the accuracy testing. I didn't mean to infer that you can't ask questions. Well, thank you for your presentation. Leader Thayer has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for your presentation today. Uh, I'm going to bring up two topics that sort of dovetail together and then ask a question. We know about uh, the voter rolls cleanup effort that has been underway under Secretary Adams' administration after being previously ignored by his predecessor, despite a federal decree. And we appreciate that. So I want to ask part of my question being when you say clean up the rolls, what does that mean? I think it would be good for this committee to have that on the record. How many people have been removed from the rolls for the various reasons outlined in the federal decree? And then, as we all know, last week for the first time in history, registered Republicans now outnumber registered Democrats in Kentucky. We know anecdotally that a lot of people are switching parties, but I would also uh, ascribe some of the credit to the efforts of your office uh, in dealing with these voter rolls. And I wondered if you could explain a little bit about the voter roll cleanup and if there's a number that you can assign to the switch from uh, minority registration to majority registration for the Republican Party, how much of that you can ascribe to the voter rolls cleanup? Is that a clear enough multifaceted, <laughs> multi-pronged question? I don't have the numbers right here on me. Um, I can get it for the committee. Um, I don't know that we can necessarily determine what attributes the switch, um, but I can't. Oh, I think we know why people are switching. Well, no, I'm saying that. <laughs> I mean, I think I might have tweeted about it last week if anybody wants to read it. But I, I, some people asked me last week about this very question because they know that Secretary Adams has been working very hard, cleaned up the voter rolls, 
and some people just asked me if if we had any idea, uh, and I can understand why you wouldn't. It's a very complex process. But so let's go back to my original question: When we talk about cleaning up the voter rolls, what does that mean? There are multi ways that voters are removed. Um, easy, they send a note to the county clerk saying, I've moved out of the county, moved out of the state, please remove me. Um, we also, State Board of Elections gets notifications from AOC regarding felony convictions, as well as from the federal courts. Um, we also have, um, from vital statistics, we get notifications on deaths within Kentucky. And then finally, we get from the court systems if someone has been determined to have their vote taken away by the courts. Um, one of the biggest things I think that has assisted us over the last two and a half years also is ERIC. Um, it allows us to get with the other member states. Please, please explain acronyms because yeah. we, we all know AOC means Administrative Office of the Courts, not the Congresswoman from, from New York, but perhaps our viewers don't know. True. I'm sorry. Elections, we talk in acronyms and just stop me. Um, ERIC is the elect Electronic Registration Information Center. Um, it is a member state type organization. So right now, I think there are 31 states that are members. Um, what they do is they get information from each state from their transportation cabinet, as well as their um, state board of elections or the vote voter registration information they mash this data to determine if someone has gotten a driver's license or registered to vote in another state after the date they registered in kentucky um, that does not remove the voter but what that does is allow for us to look at voters that might have moved we send them an nvra mailing national voter registration act which um, is the prescribed way to be able to remove a voter if we don't have contact with them. So then after that postcard notification goes, within four years or two federal elections, that voter can be removed if they have not voted or updated their information. The first purge or removal um, under um, the NVRA will be occur after this 2022 general election. Um, one of the other things that Eric also does is we get the Social Security death index, which if a voter dies in Kentucky, we get their information. But we have snowbirds that die in Florida. We have all sorts of things. So what this allows us to do is remove those voters and look back in time to voters that may have died 10, 20 years ago. Thank you for that answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Graham has a question. Thank you. I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, to thank you all for being honest and direct and letting the public know that our elections are uh, protected and that every citizen's vote counts and every senator's uh, every citizen's vote uh, is recognized. So thank you. I don't think you were being um, arrogant or aggressive in your comments. I think you were trying to provide us with the truth. So I want to shout out to you, uh, to the two of you, for stating the truth. Uh, a couple, of, and I see my um, own county clerk, Jeff Hancock, is, is back there. And we've had a discussion about the voting centers versus the precincts across the county. Uh, I know that the two largest counties are still maintaining the precincts. How many counties are still maintaining precinct voting, and how many counties are participating in the voting centers? If you can... I believe, and I don't have the exact numbers, but I believe of the 120 counties for the primary, there were probably about a dozen that still did all of their precincts open. Um, a good majority, well over 100, had vote centers. Um, and it seemed to go well. I mean, we the had very few... Um, if any, complaints about the vote center versus a precinct. Uh, I think the counties did an excellent job of reaching in rural counties, you know, a small group in a larger county. Um, Pike is a good example, Bell, um, some in western Kentucky, and made every effort to reach those precincts on election day. Um, well, I know here in, in our county, uh, it went pretty well, mm -hmm. uh, and the county clerk and I have been in discussions about it. Um, 
in terms of the turnout, was it any different uh, in terms of was it bigger, was it smaller, about the same with having the precincts versus the, the uh, uh, voting centers? I would, our turnout was very low this year for the yeah. primary. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily attributed to, you know, precinct um, vote center. I think it is, some of it goes to people keep hearing that they can't trust our elections. So, And that's why it's important for you to, it, to it's make important. that call Absolutely. And, and let it's people important. know that. And, and, and the last thing, Mr. Chairman, um, I wanted to ask the question. Um, the 11 counties that you talked about uh, that needed upgrading, uh, are they in a particular area of the, of the Commonwealth or are they spread out across the Commonwealth? Spread out. It's not any particular area at all. It, it's just that maybe they did not have budget dollars to go ahead and purchase and take advantage of our 6.7 million, but will now take advantage of the uh, 25 million in the biennium budget. Um, so, and I think if I may uh, comment about the vote centers versus precinct, I think coming up in November might be a better way for us to do a little bit of judgment on how people feel about the precinct versus vote Is that center. Because turnout will probably be higher. Right. And so how, I how think that might be a, a good way. Before it's replaced, and I'm, I'm through, Mr. Chairman. After that. The How machines long? we currently have, or the machines we've been replacing since 2019, um, were bought under HAVA dollars when Trey Grayson was Secretary of State. So it's been the early 2000s. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're, all you're welcome. We have one more question before we allow our vendors to come up and present. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, I'm going to do two very brief questions if I could. I think mm -hmm. I can really, really quick. Uh, my first question is, of the counties that have paper ballots, do they have 100% paper ballots, or are there some ballots that will not have a paper backup? I think I believe the only issues we have right now with not having paper ballots are our um, ADA um, accessible machines, and that is what we are pushing for replacement of right now. But, okay. I mean, the others, so it's only the ADA machines that are not paper. Okay, thank you for that. And then the second question real quick. Um, I know that the Secretary of State has a plan in place to clean up the, the, the voter registration. When does, is there a time frame when you guys think that that will actually be accomplished or is accomplished as much as you possibly can? Or, you know, are we 10 years away from that or two years away from that? I think, I think we will see major improvement after November of this year. There are several asterisk those voters currently on the roll that are set to be removed um, after this election. Um, I, I would say in the next four to eight years, as long as it's continued, we should see market improvement. But the, the reality is with list maintenance, it has to be continuous. Otherwise, you have you miss somebody. So, I mean, you have to send those mailings out every year in order to make sure that your roles, roles are accurate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two more short questions. Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would have waited for the vendors, but I didn't know if they'd have an answer for this. Um, real quick, the uh, portal. It's opened uh, 45 days prior to the election, final election day. Uh, this portal can be uh, accessed by the clerk, clerk's office, or an individual voter. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll go oh. real fast with this okay. and get the answer. So if I'm voting 45 days before the election day, I can call the clerk, give them my information, they mail me the ballot, I take the ballot, vote it, and put it in a drop box. 45 days, 44 days, 43, all the way up to election day, you have the drop boxes that you drop this in. So this is still in effect? Yes, sir. Okay. So, pardon? Right. That's right. that's yes. strictly absentee, correct. Uh, okay. Then let's go back real quick, Mr. Chairman. Yes. To I, need, I just need this clarified. Sure. We talk about harvesting. Absolutely. So you're telling me that I can't get on my phone 45, 44 days before the election, fill out the information in the portal, and the ballot not be mailed to me? 
Yes, it yes. It, it will, will be, be mailed, mailed to, you. to you. Yes. Okay. With an excuse, you know the the portal Okay, does we we give a list of excuses, yes. and I can find one that I want to use. Yes. The ba- the ballot's going to be mailed to me when I fill out my information on the portal. Similar to the election prior to this one, when we had the pandemic, uh, our, and we didn't have the results for 30 days after the election. I'm just saying that there is a process for somebody to go on the portal 45 days prior to the election, up to election day, order a ballot, be sent to their 14 days. 14 days. Okay, then, then correct me. I stated 45, 44, 43. So, you can request the ballot 45 days before the election. Okay. You cannot request the ballot the last 14 days. Okay. With the exception of medical Day emergency. 45 before the election, I can get on my cell phone, go to the portal, put my information in that I did two years ago, get the ballot mailed to me, cast my ballot, and drop it in the drop box wherever the two or three are located or wherever they're located. Is that not correct? Yes. yes okay. Sir. That's all that I wanted to clarify. I can vote 45 days before the election day mm-hmm. by using the portal the same way I did two years ago during the pandemic. That's all I wanted to clarify. Mr. Chairman, I think that needs more clarification. It's not the same way. You have to say that you're going to be out of town. If you say you're going to be out of town or unavailable to go to the polls and, you, and, and you're lying, that is a felony. In the, in, the, in the COVID situation, it was lawful to do that. I want the citizens to know, if you are not going to be out of town during the three early day votings and the voting day, and you do this, you're committing a felony that is very different than COVID. So is that correct? In all due respect, uh, uh, Representative Nemes and, and Mr. Chairman, what I'm trying to point out is there's a process ab- other than absentee voting that you get mailed an application, fill out, mail it back. They mail you the form, the voting uh, ballot. You vote it, sign two signatures that match, send back. That's an absentee ballot. What I'm talking about is a prior a way that we have access to in a portal to vote a ballot that's not the same as an absentee ballot. So I want to clarify there's two methods of early voting other than the three machines. One of them is you get on the portal and you fill out the information and the clerk's office mails you the ballot. Sir, that is just for absentee ballots. It is just for excused so, absentee ballots. Okay, so you're saying there's not an absentee ballot that they mail you an application for? Not anymore. Not anymore. That's no. gone. This, the portal takes the place of that application. Okay. This allows for the voter to be able to track their absentee ballot, shows when you requested, when the county clerk mailed it back, and then when it was received back by the county clerk. Okay, so there's not that verification of the two signatures, all that that you we have. You will still have to have the signatures on the envelopes for your absentee ballot. Okay, so it's not just a direct ballot 45 days prior. That is correct. So ordering it on the portal doesn't get you a ballot. Not unless you have one of the excuses. But but filling that out, you're saying you have that, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for taking up so much time, Mr. Tra- Chairman, but th- this has been a question. That my clerk even said that the voting started 45 days prior. So that's what I was trying to clarify the process. So, uh, again, I apologize. I'm just trying to get that part cleared up because that is questions I've had. Appreciate it. All right. Senator Wheeler. Just briefly. Um Board Chair Sellers mentioned, you know, Pike County is a very large geographic area, and we did uh, move from our normal 56 precincts to, I believe, 17 super precincts the last time. Now, uh, I have one of these super precincts in my normal voting precinct, so it really wasn't a problem for me, but I did have some complaints uh, from some folks uh, in other parts of the county, and and um, if the county was to need more resources to get additional machines to open which i understand that uh that's actually the default mechanism the 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 county clerk would have to submit a a, an alternative proposal for approval Mm -hmm. Uh, are those resources available uh, from the secretary of state and uh, the board of elections to assist some rural counties that may have some difficulties with budgeting and, and uh, 
providing some additional access and, uh, and equipment for uh, opening those precincts. Uh, Pike County is a good example, and uh, they did take advantage of the $6.7 million when they, that we had closing our HAVA security fund at State Board of Elections. Uh, they are also eligible under the 12.5 over two years of a biennium. They could, if they so chose, to buy more equipment. And I will go back when uh, it was mentioned about the uh, machines, the ADA machines. That's one of the things I'm encouraging the county you know, funding. Let's get those. That would be a good example of additional machines that the counties are going to need to move that also to paper. Uh, but yes, that would be if they did choose to get more equipment, they could access uh, additional funding. Yeah, I mean, and, and just a brief follow-up, yeah, I, I understand, and I, you know, anemic, or the turnout in the primary this year was, was really pretty anemic, to be honest with you, and, and I think to some degree that may have been as a result of folks not having access to the normal precincts, which I understand is to a large part a problem of, of getting people to work those precincts. But uh, uh, I think we want to encourage the, 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 as many people to vote as we can. And, and, and so uh, I thank you for that answer, and I will definitely communicate to our clerk and other county officials about those resources. So thank you. Okay, we're going to shift and we're going to uh, allow our vendors to come forward and then we'll return to our questions queue. We've got several more there, but if we want to have the folks from ES&S come forward, we've got two gentlemen that have traveled here from, I believe, out of town and I'll let them introduce themselves and give their background. And gentlemen, we're obviously you can hear the type of questions that we have. We're very concerned about election security and how that's handled through your voting equipment. So welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Brandon Clifton. I serve as Senior Vice President of Government Affairs with ESNS. Uh, next to me is Tucker O'Mell, an engineer with ESNS. Uh, in a prior life, I've uh, well, I've been with the company since October, but before that, served as chief of staff and deputy secretary to the Indiana Secretary of State, where we somehow forgot how to play basketball. And Kentucky has certainly picked up where Indiana left off. Uh, please bear with me as I uh, want to work from some prepared remarks, and then uh, which will hopefully answer most or some of your questions, and then we'll go into Q and A. So ESNS Workforce based in Omaha, an American-owned and operated company that supplies technology to 23 of, of your counties here in the Commonwealth. Over the country, we serve uh, 1,600 county-level jurisdictions. Uh, we've been in business uh, for more than 40 years, have a single uh, majority owner uh, by uh, the name of Mike McCarthy, who's a member of uh, McCarthy Group, um, a capital firm in Omaha, Nebraska. And the other 20% is owned by the executive management team and other employees of ESNS. We, we, we certainly welcome uh, your interest in this topic. We welcome your inquiry. We welcome your suspicion and we welcome your questions. We think it's uh, wonderful for the elections community uh, and tremendous for elections going forward. Testified today, certainly without reservation with regard to the products that ESNS offers. Um, and, and like to talk about testing, would like to talk about paper ballots and auditing. So with regard to testing, it's just, it's just so core to what we do and who we've become internal to the company and then of course externally facing with our customers. Without, without testing and security in this space, one I just simply can't survive. Each piece of equipment and software is put through a litany of security, functionality, accessibility, usability, and environmental, environmental testing before it's ever used in an, in an election. It's test, tested by us, tested by the Election Assistance Commission, and the Commonwealth, of course, certainly has its own certification process. And that, that of course, doesn't, doesn't include the LNA testing that, that occurs before an, a, an election, public tests that occur before an election is conducted. So uh, beginning to end, and then even post-election audits serve as a, as a type of, of test uh, with regard to the integrity and ac accuracy of, of the equipment itself. So uh, before a product ever leaves our headquarters in Omaha, to the point where and after 
uh, ballots have been um, uh, prepared by a ballot marking device or tabulated by a tabulator. Testing occurs throughout the life, life cycle of the elections process. With regard to paper records, paper records is, of course, uh, also integral to the success of, of, of election integrity and ongoing integrity in this country. Uh, we were the first to voluntarily stop selling uh, what are known as DREs, uh, direct record electronic um, uh, tabulators that don't have a paper trail associated with it. And of course, uh, paper trails and, and verifiable paper trails uh, provide uh, the opportunity to conduct meaningful, substantial post-election audits which of course increases the accuracy and the confidence of, of elections, increases the confidence that the machines tabulated as they were programmed to tabulate and um, uh, builds trust in our community once again. We hold ourselves accountable for raising the bar on election related products and services and view ourselves as, as some of the industry's leaders in the space. It's a very small market, it's a very difficult market. There's a lot of scrutiny in this market. Uh, but, but we have uh, survived for over 40 years and look forward to the 40 years to come. We know that improving the confidence of every election, of every voter requires tight collaboration between federal, state, local law enforcement, uh, local election administrators, and the public itself. We believe that collectively we can provide necessary and continuous improvement in election security. Those are just a few of, of the highlights of our approach, and I'd like to dive in, if I could, just a little bit more with regard to testing. Every ESNS system we field undergoes rigorous testing by independent federal test labs accredited by the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, or NIST. Since 2009, ESNS has certified more than two dozen unique voting system releases through this federal testing program. We continue to submit updated versions of our software to the EAC for states uh, and states for testing and approval uh, on a regular and consistent basis. We also conduct thorough and pervasive penetration testing of our hardware and software using some of the same tools that are our best practices and in the industry standards in the field. We also engage in third party independent testing to regular, regularly test samples of the components that we use in our equipment, especially with regard to programmable logic devices. We do this to validate uh, our supply chain security and ensure that no backdoor tampering has occurred. We're working with industry partners to create the nation's first coordinated vulnerability disclosure program, or CVDP, uh, for elections equipment designed to uh, provide even greater third party and independent testing into our community. Regarding our development and manufacturing processes, all ESNS tabulation firmware and software are housed domestically and written exclusively within the United States. All final hardware configuration of ESNS voting machines is, is performed also in the United States. ESNS voting machine components are produced in secure ISO 9001 certified manufacturing facilities, and the entire voting system is managed by a secure engineering change order and control process. ESNS designs and manufactures purpose built voting equipment. We know where every programmable piece and part comes from, and that is free from defect. To ensure the sustainability, of our voting systems, ESNS designs dur durable, uh, excuse me, um, designs, designs ensure durability, ease of maintenance, and availability of parts and supplies. The ESNS supply chain is the most extensive in the elections industry. Final, some final comments here. ESNS Secure Management System, also known as EMS, another acronym here in the industry, are hardened. That means that the computer is locked down with and allows access only to functions required to conduct an election. Unused ports are, are blocked and unnecessary services are removed. System hardening is aligned with federal and industry standards to achieve acceptable levels of integrity and voting system reliability. As you know, the Commonwealth of Kentucky does not allow for the transfer, as we heard earlier, uh, for unofficial, unofficial election results via modem or other cell, cellular connectivity. 
And to that end, modem components do not exist in certified fielded equipment in the state. And the ESS, ESNS equipment here does not support the ability to modem. None of that technology is cur currently in place within the Commonwealth. Each detail is important in securing elections. And I hope just a few of these examples have been helpful to you that we take security in every aspect of our business uh, with the seriousness it, it deserves. In closing, I want to be clear that neither we nor our customers are perfect. On a rare occasion, humans make mistakes, and, and, and sometimes we see that in the news. But it is our, uh, um, our, our goal to offer uh, constituents, our customers, as perfect of an election as possible. So thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, Tucker and I are available for your questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Clifton. Uh, I think uh, just a side note for members, they they have brought their equipment with them uh, for, the, for you to take a look if you have specific questions after the meeting. I think what we'll do is we'll let the next vendor come forward, and then we'll ask questions as as needed by uh, by each vendor. So we'll bring a, a Harp Enterprises forward. Not so hard. Jim, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Bobby Gantley. I'm the president of Harp Enterprises, and I'll let these gentlemen introduce themselves who are with us today. Uh, Ross Robertson, vice president of sales for Harp Enterprises. Okay, and watch your mic when you start. You just got to hit the yep. green button. There you go. Ross Robertson, vice president of sales for Harp Enterprises. There you go. I'm Stephen Sockwell, vice president of corporate communications for Hart InterCivic. Very good. Thank you. So I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having us here today and members of the committee. Um, Harp Enterprises is celebrating 50 years of being business in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Um, we are an election services organization. And the reason I'm starting out with that is we are not the manufacturer of the Verity voting equipment that we service and support. We are the official reseller and our partner, Hart Inner Civic is the manufacturer. That's why we brought them here from Austin, Texas to be in front of you all, as well as some of our customers, that this is our partner who we're dealing with and we are not manufacturing the equipment here in Kentucky. So I'm gonna let Steven start out with our presentation and I'll follow up. Great, thank you. I assume I can just open this up here on the- Yes, your mic and then hit your mic there. Can everybody see that? Good. Yes. If you could pull your mic forward. Sure. You Thank you. So uh, as I said, I'm Stephen Sockwell. Uh, I work at Hart's headquarters in Austin, Texas. Uh, tell you a little bit about the company. Um, we are a full service end-to-end uh, -end, uh, election technology vendor, and we've been in business for over 100 years. Uh, we're focused on, the, on elections exclusively. We don't have other parts of our business. Um, this is what we do. It's what we've been doing for a very long time. Uh, we support um, state-level customers, county-level customers, small municipal jurisdictions, kind of the very biggest to the very smallest, and uh, we're very proud of the feedback we receive from our customers, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. We have uh, a little bit over 840 customers across 20 states here in the United States. We don't do any business outside of the United States. We're exclusively uh, a U.S. company. We, uh, we have a very experienced staff in Austin. Uh, many of our employees uh, came from uh, the election space, former election officials, uh, managing operations uh, of elections, and so we put their knowledge to work in how we help service our customers. Uh, as I said before, we've been in business a little over 109 years, 840 customers in 20 states, and I also wanted to point out that the product that we're selling uh, through our partnership with HARP in 
uh, Kentucky is about five-year-old technology. Uh, the question came up earlier, you know, is it old stuff? Is it new stuff? Uh, we're proud of the fact that this is relatively fresh technology and our engineering team is always working to make advancements and enhancements. Um, and those go through the certification process uh, as, you, as you're familiar with by now, um, so that we can always continue to bring improvements to our customers in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, I, this is a very popular topic, um, as you might imagine. So I'm, I'm proud to tell you that all of our products are made in the United States. Our um, primary manufacturing facility is located two miles down the road from our headquarters in Austin. Uh, we also have redundant U.S. manufacturing facilities uh, just to ensure co continuity of operations. If anything were to happen in one location, we can immediately switch to the other. Uh, and the logos you see on this slide are just some examples of uh, kind of the manufacturing certifications uh, that we that we use um, in in the manufacturing of our products. I referred earlier to customer satisfaction. We're very proud of the fact that we survey our customers every year. We invite all of them to complete a survey uh, and ask for very honest feedback. Um, our overall customer satisfaction. We have a we have a bunch of questions in the survey, but one of them is just overall how satisfied are you? And we've had 13 surveys in a row dating back to 2009 uh, with a customer satisfaction of over 90%. So that's kind of where we've set the bar for ourselves, but we continue to try to raise the bar. Uh, and we are happy to share this information. Um, and we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to respond to our customers um, and, and continue to improve their experience. We're here today, obviously, to talk about security. Security starts not just with the technology, but before that, it starts with our people. Uh, everyone at heart goes through a comprehensive background check. Um, everyone in the company goes through um, cybersecurity training. And everyone in the company participates, uh, per their job function, uh, in uh, Department of Homeland Security election security roundtables. If you're not familiar with roundtables, they're effectively a hypothetical situation. What, what would happen if something went wrong? What would you do? So we rehearse situations uh, to try to make sure that we're prepared for anything that might happen. Uh, the good news is, is through data redundancy and paper ballots, which we're going to talk about a lot today, um, there, there are not a lot of gaps in that process, uh, but we always want to make sure we stay up to date through our partners with whatever the latest vulnerabilities might be out there in the world. Um, and that's a perfect segue into this slide, which talks to you a little bit about who we're partnered with. Uh, we serve directly um, on committees with all of the organizations you see here. Uh, the National Association of Secretary of State's meeting was just uh, last week in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and we're, the National Association of State Election Directors, I believe, is coming up this week or, or maybe, maybe, maybe next. Now, I can't remember the exact dates. They all, they all kind of blend together. But we're, we work closely with all of these organizations to make sure that we're sharing information um, so that we can all contribute effectively to election security. I want to talk to you just a little bit about the Verity product. Obviously, we brought it here uh, into the committee room for you to look at and, uh, and test drive if you'd like. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of an overview of the product itself. Uh, as you've heard many times today, uh, this product is never connected to the internet. Uh, we provide voter verifiable paper audit trails. So there's a paper ballot for every voter. We do not encode voter selections in barcodes. Now this is something that um, is a big deal for us. We want to make sure we believe philosophically that if a voter is reviewing their choices that they made on their ballot, that the scanner that's reading their choices is reading the same words that the voter is reading. So if I vote for Mary Smith, the scanner will read Mary Smith. The scanner does not read barcode, 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 barcode. It reads the words Mary Smith. So uh, that's a unique um, feature of our product and we believe it's the right thing to do for, for, for your voters. Uh, I talked about the fact that we're designed, developed, and manufactured in the United States. Uh, our product is fully accessible for voters with disabilities. Um, and we, and we support all types of post-election audits and all of our devices provide plain language audit logs. Uh, and by plain language, I mean you and I could read it. It would tell you Mary logged in at 5 a.m. She logged off at 7 a.m. Bob came and logged in and here's what he did while he was logged in. Then Bob logged out. And so if there's ever any question about who's using the system, how they accessed it, what they did while they were on the system, all those audit logs are available uh, to the election officials. I won't try to cover everything that's on this slide, but the point of it is to show that in the areas of hardware, software, and auditability, we believe that the Verity security features stack up um, in, a, in, a, 
in a very strong way relative to other options. Um, the, again, the, the features that are listed here uh, are some of the ones that you've heard about today. There's also a lot of features on this slide that uh, I'm happy to answer questions about, possibly uh, when, the, when the meeting adjourns. Um, but we, we include all of these features into our systems. We don't want to cut corners in any way, and we don't want to sacrifice election security for you know, an easier manufacturing process or anything like that. Um, I talked earlier about the, the paper trail, no voter choices and barcodes. Uh, voters who might vote on a bilingual ballot will see their choices in their native language as well as in English. So if a, if a non-English speaking voter is reviewing their ballot, they can review it in language they understand. But if somebody later on is conducting an audit and that person speaks English, the person conducting the audit can see the, so the same ballot in, in language that they understand. We provide our voters with a full-size ballot. Um, it's an eight and a half by 11 or eight and a half by 14 or 17 or however long it needs to be. Uh, ballot summary, if they use our, one of our ballot marking devices, uh, because we believe that's just a better voter experience um, as opposed to a, a smaller size uh, summary. I want to talk very briefly. Uh, I don't want, mean to treat anybody in here like they, like they don't know what they're doing, but we get a lot of questions about this, so I want to try to walk through this very quickly and very simply. The voting process basically, uh, and, and I'm not talking about things upstream like voter registration or voter check-in, and I'm not talking about things downstream like election night reporting or anything like that. I'm talking about just the voting experience. And it basically includes providing a ballot to the voter, the voter marking the ballot, and the voter scanning the ballot. And when those things happen, then the voter's ready to leave. So in our system, we provide choices to our customers in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. They, in terms of providing a ballot to the voter, uh, counties can pre-print ballots before the election, or they can print ballots on demand as voters walk into the polling location. Either way, the voter then has to mark a ballot. So they can either mark the ballot by hand, or they can mark a ballot with a ballot marking device. Typically, ballot marking devices are used by voters with disabilities, but certainly any voter could use one as well. Regardless of how you vote, by hand or with, with a ballot marking device, the ballot then has to go into the scanner. It's, it's th th those three steps. You give them a ballot, they mark it one way or another, and it goes into the scanner. So you can see our products in, in the images across the bottom of the screen. That's what we provide. We provide a, an option for uh, Counties to print ballots on demand if they choose to, but they don't have to. We provide multiple options for uh, ballot marking devices for voters with disabilities. And then we provide the scanner, which captures the voters' choices. And I believe that's it. I'm going to hand it back over to Bobby. Go to the next slide. Yeah. So as I mentioned when I started, um, Harp Enterprise has been in business for 50 years, serving the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We currently provide service to 97 of the 120 counties um, here in the state. And the reason I bring up the 50 years um, and what we do, you just heard that we don't manufacture the equipment. So when people ask me what I do for a living and I tell them elections, they ask me what I do for the 11, the other 11 months out of the year, because apparently elections happen overnight as far as that goes. And our business philosophy that we do since the primary ended the second week in June, from now until November 8th, our company is working on the general election. It's not an overnight task, three and a half, four and a half months. So this is where our company comes in as the reseller service provider to our customers here in the state. So as I said before, we were founded in 1972 by R.J. Hart. We started out as a printing company. We just quickly transitioned into printing absentee ballots. Uh, then we moved into the old lever machines, then it went into electronic machines and into the current systems that we use today as far as that goes. So printing business to that, we do print ballots in-house. I will go into more detail as far as that goes um, once we get to the next slide. So as Stephen mentioned, we partnered with Hard Inner Civic 2004. We had a lot of similarities. They started out as a printing company. We have... Um, over the years, we became the official reseller. We don't manufacture it, but everything else that we do at our facility in Lexington, when I'm going to go through, we build the actual databases. We program all the media for all of the voting machines. We set all the voting machines um, all the way down to election night. This is a process that goes on and on and on 
election after election um, till you have the off year. And that really isn't an off year as far as that goes, as far as elections go. This last page is really what I want to get into as far as what we have. And I believe, Representative Graham, you asked earlier about the counties that have not upgraded. On this, the counties in green on our map have our Heart HVS legacy system. They do have paper ballot scanners in the precinct. Um, what they have are a non-paper verifiable trail. That's what we're looking to upgrade with some of these counties present day, and these numbers are. So the blue have already upgraded to our Verity voting system, and the green are the ones that we are trying to upgrade and will upgrade before 2024, but that's where they stand. So when you asked where they were in the state, and I believe uh, Ms. Scutchfield was talking about how old they were as far as that goes. So service is what we do. Um, this goes for every election, ballot, pickup, layout. We get name sheets from candidates, local. Our sales department goes out, we bring that back. Database production. The software that Hart uses, proprietary, our team has been trained on that. Every database is built at our facility. Nothing goes to Texas. We get it back from them. It's built right at 2400 Merchant Street. All audio files, if someone has to use a ballot marking device and they need that capability, that's done right there at our facility as well. All proofreading, ballot printing. Every ballot that services our customers comes from our facility. Nothing is outsourced right there at our warehouse. Voting machine setting. We send five to eight people that visit every county and set every machine in the state. There are a few counties that have come to us and they want to set their own machines. They have to go through a process with us of checks and balances, what they're looking for for accuracy testing, things of that nature. So we just don't let anyone come through, go through and start setting voting machines. Um, precinct election officer training. This is a big ordeal throughout the state to make sure everyone gets trained. We do roughly around 100 of these classes for every election, okay? That's a lot of time on the road training precinct election officers. That's laws, opening, closing, how the machines function, things of that nature. And that's one of the keys, Ross and three other guys, I do some myself, um, but we cover the entire state. Accuracy testing on every database, that's been brought up today. It's why we're here to talk about it has to be done right. Every database has accuracy testing to make sure the exact results come out every time before the machine works on election day. It's as simple as that. It has to go through. The county clerks have to sign off on it. That's not something we developed. That was part of, I believe, a KAR years ago to get accuracy testing to make sure this is done right. One thing that we are proud of, and I'm almost done to wrap up, uh, of course, we do election day support in any county that wants us there for election day, but we do regional training sites across the state because I can't have county clerks out in McCracken County to drive to Lexington to get training. So I set up sites around there where they get end of night reporting on the software for them and their staff. We also do it at our facility. We do that for every election as well. And one of the big things that we are proud of as far as security, chain of custody, that's important today. And I don't know if anyone else does it, but I know that we do it. The election media, the little V drives, USBs that record all the votes in the machines that are brought back and tallied at the end of the night, none of that is mailed to any of our customers. If I have to go all the way out to Fulton County, which we do, they're hand delivered by a HARP employee. Nothing goes through the mail. Um, every database for election night is set up by a HARP employee who goes there physically before. So we're making at least three to five trips to 97 of these counties for every election. Okay, that's all that I have on our. Does that complete your present presentation? Yes, sir. Very good, thank you so much. Okay, now we have a queue of questions here and I'm just gonna ask, when you're asking your question, since we've got three different groups of folks that may let us know or ask your question directly to either the Secretary of State's Office, Board of Elections, or our vendors that are here. So Co-Chair Miller had a question, as a question. Well, it came up in the uh, presentation of the Secretary of State's office, but I'm, I'll just put it out generally to these gentlemen. 
and that is we are in a low trust environment. I think we all understand and accept that. Uh, and and uh, Ms. Scutchfield mentioned that there were seals on the machines. Could you talk about that and what does that seal mean in terms of protection? Uh, is it possible that for someone to install a modem or a Bluetooth device, anything along those lines, if that seal's in place properly? I can go ahead and take that. Um, the Each of the machines uh, has locks on them uh, that safeguard the V drives that he was talking about. There's also, every place there's a lock, there is a place for a security seal to be put on there. Those security seals as either placed on by HARP representatives or poll workers on the day of election, um, and I can talk more about that process, those seals are recorded on verification sheets. So each machine has its verification sheet that is recorded with precinct or location names, um, the serial numbers of the device, and all the seals that are recorded for each of the protective lock systems. So if any of those are tampered with, broken, or anything, those have to be reported back. Did, did that answer? Or? Well, and I, I did want to ask, in, in, although everybody says they're not connected to the Internet, you know, with yes. Wi-Fi, wireless systems, and Bluetooth, I just want to make sure, and I want to hear it from you, how is, is that possible, and how do you know that it's not? Uh, first of all, there is no modems or no c connectivity to the Internet, um, and there is no way for somebody, if they were even possible on d through an election, if they were to hook something up to our equipment. We have proprietary USB port in the back that is notched. If they put, and it's paired differently on the wiring, so if they tried to insert a cable that was a USB cable. One, it wouldn't fit, and two, if they were able to get it in there, we have what's called a kiosk mode on our equipment, mm -hmm. and it's protective things. So if it looks at anything coming new into that machine, the first thing it does, and I don't want to get real technical, but there's hash files on the machine. It's looking for matching hash files, and if these do not match, it will shut itself down. Mm -hmm. It shuts itself down for purposely to make sure nothing is tampered with with the equipment, no um, malware or any of that can be placed on the machine. Okay, thank, thank you. Could I, uh, before I go to the next question, the uh, the ESNS engineer that was here from, would you like to uh, to real quickly address that on your equipment yeah. as well? Mr. Chairman, uh, Tucker O'Mell, sales engineer with ESNS. Uh, the question was regarding modems and their installation in the system. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, first of all, ESNS products in the Commonwealth do not have installed modems. And uh, very similar to the Harp and Hart gentlemen, uh, if, if somebody attempted to install a physical modem into the machine, just know that their physical security of the machine is paramount. And so that's why we provide over a dozen opportunities for numbered seals and tape seals. Only proprietary USB devices from ESNS will be recognized by the machine. If another USB drive that is foreign to the machine or even from an old election uh, were inserted in the machine, the machine will notify you that an unrecognized uh, device has been inserted and it will shut itself down automatically. And that, uh, that attempt to insert something is also cr uh, captured in the audit log which is a minute-by-minute, step-by-step record of every single action that was taken on the machine for, for the duration of the election. And that includes pre-election testing all the way through when the final ballot is cast. Uh, likewise, we also, our machines have the ability to, the ability to hash, capture a hash value of all the computer code that is loaded on that system. Okay, a hash, a hash value is basically a computer summary of this is every bit and byte of that's on this machine. It summarizes it into a string of letters and numbers. Okay, and uh, the EAC also captures that hash value when they certify that exact firmware. 
if anyone tries to load a single bit of data that is not appropriate for that system, the counties can produce their own hash of their systems at that very time and compare it to the gold copy that the EAC has on file. Senator Southworth has a question. Mr. Chairman, I had a question for the state board, but then I had a different question after the ESNS people came. So okay. I don't you can ask a couple questions. Go in order here. Um, since hold on, since uh, the engineers on at the table, maybe we'll start backwards. Um, the poll books. So I vote in a county where we have pick up your paper ballot and mark it yourself, which is awesome. And um, some of my friends don't live in those counties. So uh, for the people who are getting stuck on these tablet systems, my understanding is they sign in and then they get their, um, I don't know if it's QR, barcode, or what kind of code, but from the poll book that I think sequences for the ballot faces, they then put into the ESNS or the heart, whatever Verity system we're talking about. Can, how is the engineering coordinating? Because I haven't heard anything about poll books yet. Do you, does ESNS, because I don't think we use ESNS or heart for poll books. So I don't no, know if y'all make poll books. But how do you coordinate between manufacturers at, with the poll book? programming or whatnot who, who does that is that the same thing we're hearing about now with programming voting machines or is it something else i understand uh, 10x to be the e-poll book provider so it would um it, i'm not dodging your question i appreciate your question it might be more appropriate for the state to answer that just not familiar with the with the with the marrying between uh the state and the technology that's uh, at use here in the state um, I'll, I'll attempt to, if I understood your question correctly, it is, it is how does, the, how does the, the voter's precinct information get to the machine? And I, presume, I, I, I don't want to presume too much, but when we hear this question in other places, it sometimes is related to, does the machine know who the voter is? Does the voter's personal information follow them through that process? My question is really more like the coordination between manufacturers. I see. How do you know what the code is to program the tablet you know, I see. for the precincts? So it, generally speaking, when a voter checks in and the, the poll book, whether it's 10X or anybody else's, will generate a report, uh, a little piece of paper that says this voter, and we don't know who they are on the piece of paper, needs to vote uh, with ballot style 219A. And so the, the, the poll worker can then provide the proper ballot, whether it's a pre-printed physical ballot, whether it's a print on demand, they'll just touch the screen that says 219A, it'll print up the ballot, they hand it to the voter. So it's, there's no electronic connection between the poll book and the system that's providing the ballot. Okay, and yeah. Sen Senator Southworth, I can also talk to you a little bit about the data flow. The ESNS uh, EMS system, election management system, the software that's on the hardened electionware PC that runs on our computer, it outputs a tiny data file, which basically just summarizes these are the ballot styles and the precincts that are in this election that we're aware of. That single file is sneaker netted on a USB drive that only goes one way from that system that's not connected to the internet to uh, the 10X system where they learn what we've numbered the precincts and things like that. And that's how they know what barcode to print on the voter's receipt uh, that, that does not even identify the voter. It simply names the correct ballot style for them. So it is a data flow that is one way only, uh, and we never accept anything back from the 10X system. I, mean, that, I think that does hit my question. So my other question was for the board um, relating to um, the audit. Yes, ma'am. So the slide um, you shared about the expanded audit process said the um, risk limiting mm -hmm. audit needed to be done randomly and apolitically, and then you corrected yourself and said, well, not really exactly randomly. And earlier this year when I was um, working on this audit situation, uh, it came to the surface that uh, you all were looking at c maybe adopting a Colorado model. And when I looked into Colorado, they were pre-choosing 30 days before the election exactly what they were going to audit and then publishing on their website what the audit was going to cover. And I felt like that wasn't a random selection and it was not safe or secure in any way, shape, or form. So 
since we passed the risk limiting audit legislation last year and went into effect over a year ago, we're just now starting the risk limiting audit. Can you say what do you mean by not random? And is it going to be random or is it not going to be random? Is it a Colorado model or is it something else? Okay, so let me make sure. So the Colorado model, it's not a Colorado model. We're using a consultant that is helping us prepare the model that we will use for the risk limiting audit for the Commonwealth. Now, in the uh, legislation that was passed, it said we would begin with a pilot program, which that's what we will be doing in November. And we have six counties that are participating that are working with us in a work group currently to develop our model that we will use to perform the risk limiting audit after the general election. And actually two of the counties that are participating in that risk limiting audit, their clerks are here today with us. Um, and we tried to do a random selection of counties to larger, to medium size, to smaller counties. We divided them evenly between the two uh, election equipment vendors we have, Hart, InterCivic, and ESNS. Uh, all of that group is working with us uh, Secretary of State's office, State Board of Elections, the six counties that are chosen to be part of the pilot program. We have representatives from Hart Inner Civic, Harp Enterprises, and ESNS, and their technical groups are working with us as we develop the model for risk limiting audit to perform in November. And if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not speaking out of turn, I believe that we have approached Senator Mills about doing a, a report for this committee later um, in this year to up do, provide a little bit better update as we complete the process and be ready for it. Thank you. Final comment, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, I have a constituent that texted me and asked me to share this, and it's certainly not the first time I've said something similar. Um, a lot of concerns about vulnerable election machines. They want paper ballots and hand counts at the precinct level. In the, I've spent probably, well, way over a year of my life dedicated almost entirely to election issues, and I keep finding more and more stuff to look into, so there's no way we're ever going to get up to speed in our meeting. But I just want to register and reiterate one of the things that I think it was maybe ESNS said today was, or maybe it was Hart, that the paper ballots um, help the, let's see, I wrote it down, the paper ballots hardly allow any kind of, um, it just closes a lot of gaps with a lot of questions. Um, but the only reason the paper ballots close a lot of gaps with questions is when we use them. And this risk limiting audit is obviously a very extremely limited use of the paper ballots and unfortunately leaves 114 counties uh, wide open knowing they're not going to be checked. And that's a concern. So. If we could speed along the process of actually using the process that we're paying millions of dollars to upgrade systems for, um, that I think that would go a long ways in improving this. Thank you. Thank you. We, I'm going to draw a line on questions. We have five people in the queue, and we're going to ask those questions, and then any other questions uh, we may get to the staff, and we'll pass them to the board, board or the Secretary of State for answers. Representative Blanton. A very simple question. Going back to the last slide by Harp here, you got the blue, the green, you explain, but could you explain to us what the white counties are? The white counties are ES and S. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Representative Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, want to thank everybody who has uh, been here today. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in the last 12, 15 months talking about elections and election security. So uh, this is uh, uh, something that I'm very familiar with. I actually, uh, last year, myself and a couple of our colleagues had the opportunity to go to Lexington to Harp. I, I appreciate that invitation, and, and we were able to actually sit down and have a lot of one-on-one -on -one about how the machines work, about how the seals work. And, and I think if, if the general public could see that, they would feel a lot more secure. 
uh, in, in knowing this. And I appreciate it. I would encourage my colleagues today to visit with our vendors here and, and talk to them and, and ask questions uh, about this. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion about machine count versus uh, uh, pay, hand count. Uh, last year at NCSL in Tampa, I had a chance to go visit the election headquarters in Tampa, fourth largest uh, county in Florida. Now, Florida's never had any issues with elections. <laughs> so uh, let's just say they've made a lot of changes since 2000, and, and they've really focused on their elections and how they conduct their elections. And in Tampa, what I found interesting, and they use the ES and S system. That is their certified system. But they also have a second tabulating system. So the master of the votes are counted twice, and they compare system to system, and they say they come on spot on, 100%. They have no variation there between those two systems. So I just wanted to make that point. One thing we haven't talked about is the, the devices are taken out of the machines. Could the vendors just explain to the committee and to the general public a little bit about the process when, when, when that... Uh, it's not an eye, it's not it's thumb drive. The little card that comes card. out, how and what goes in it and what's included, all the way up to the tabulating computer and how that works. Could you all want to, because I think, it, you, and, and of course the tabulating computers in Kentucky are not connected to the internet too. Let's make that point clear. But just talk a little bit about the security in that and how that process takes place. Happy to. Representative Tipton, again, my name is Tucker O'Mell, sales engineer with the SNS. Uh, the USB drives that we use in our system are manufactured by a company in the United States, and they manufacture a specific model with a specific vendor ID program on, uh, programmed on them, specific to ESNS. They're the only USB devices that would be recognized by our any any machine in our product family. Okay, uh, what is on that stick? First of all, every single thing that is on the stick, I want to point this out, is encrypted using AES 256-bit encryption. You can look this up. I will not end this meeting with you all uh, snoring by explaining exactly what that means, but it is basically the world standard for encryption. Uh, what is included on that machine is the results, the tabulated results, a cast vote record for every single ballot that was inserted, meaning that it take every single ballot that's inserted has an individual tally in an individual file just for that single ballot. It also contains a ballot image, which is a picture, a digital picture of the front and back of every single ballot, as well as the encrypted audit log, which is every single action taken uh, during that day. At the end of the election, all of that is uh, encrypted and also digitally signed. Every single CASPO record and image has its own uh, digital signature. I'll let you look that up in your free time if you'd like, um, but that's the data that's captured on the stick. Did that answer the question? Now, when that when this goes to the machine to the county clerks where the votes are actually counted, what's the process in that in the tabulation computer? In the tabulation computer, so our system, known as Electionware, it knows of every single stick, every single encrypted little bundle it put on a stick. Uh, those are all, uh, it tracks every single one of those sticks. When they come back on election night, when they're physically transported from A to B, from poll to HQ, they are inserted into the Electionware PC, which I'll say again, is not connected to the internet in any way. Our system will recognize only those devices. If a foreign device is inserted, it tells you it will not it will not process it, it will not attempt to. If the same stick is inserted twice, it will not double up the totals. It knows what it's seen in the past. Um, any other further clarification you might need there? I will I will tell you that also if the polls were not closed correctly, it doesn't guess what the final results will it was. It tells you the polls have not been closed on this machine. Please correct the issue before you. I'm paraphrasing, but before you bring that stick back again, do your job right. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Would the harp or does anything change on harp equipment? Could quick quickly, uh, please. No, sir. Uh, the short answer is the 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 answer is very similar. Uh, the only thing I would add is a couple things. Uh, one, there is redundant memory on the device itself that is separate from the removable drive. So if the removable drive gets lost, you can create a replacement for it. The system is smart enough to know 
whether it's looking at an original or looking at a replacement. So you can't count an original and then count a replacement also. It won't, it won't allow that. Um, and and a, lot of these, a lot of the technology that my colleague just described is required by the uh, federal and commonwealth level uh, certification process. So we, as, as, as the regulators continue to raise the bar, we will continue to uh, make sure all that security is built in. Representative Nemus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for, I don't know if it's for Ms. Sellers or Ms. Scotchfeld, but while they're coming up to the table, I, I would note that I've practiced election law and I've had cases, elections fraud cases in civil and criminal courses around Kentucky. Um, I've taken depositions of expert witnesses, taken depositions of, of, uh, of, uh, of members of, of, of HARP. Um, I, our elections are secure. There's things to improve, but I believe in our elections. Um, I would, I want to also note that um, uh, contrary to what the, my friend, uh, Senator Southworth's constituent said she wanted, which was hand, hand counting. I would, I would note that in caution, I would say that the best friend of a fraudster is hand counting ballots. And so we don't, we don't need to be hand counting ballots. That's, that would be the worst thing we could possibly do. Out of all the election law ideas, that's the absolute worst. And I, so um, I would, now there's nothing wrong with hand counting in an audit process, but hand counting ballots is the absolute worst thing and would be the best thing, would be a, the dream of a, of a, of a cheater. Um, I do want to say one thing and then I want to ask my question. The one thing I want to say is, you said you haven't heard complaints about precincts. I have a lot. Oh. Um, and I'm very thankful that uh, Bobby Hosklaw, my clerk in Jefferson County, has went back to the precinct area and we have super centers. That's the way we ought to be going. In another county that I have, we do no, we no longer have precincts and I've heard a a, a lot of complaints about that and so we want i think we need to try to encourage our clerks to go to the precinct level maybe fewer than we had before to go to the precinct levels because what you have inevitably is you have voter suppression not intentional not intentional but a, a county like louisville you're not going to be able to go all all over louisville and so even if you have a dozen locations 20 locations it's not going to be fair to the people who live farther away from from the from the, the the super center so we need to go back to precincts and i'm glad bobby hosclaw has done that she deserves a great deal of credit here's my question i bought my house almost a decade ago i've said this on the record every year the guy i bought my house from he's still registered to vote at my house today he's not voting in my house he didn't live in my house unless he's a really good hider but why is he still registered at my house and when i go walking as we all do You'll come up to a house, Senator Southworth and I were just talking about this. You'll come up to a house and there'll be some Turners there and Rodriguez is there and Smith's there. They don't all live there. And so let's use my example. So no hypothetical. This is real. 10627 Glen Eagle Place. There's somebody who's registered in my house that hasn't lived there in eight years. So I need to know why and how long am I going to have to live with this electoral interloper? <laughs> I would hope that after this next general election, that person may be removed um, as part of our NVRA process. Now, yeah. one of the things that people, we, when I was at State Board of Elections, I would get this question too, because we sent out postcards, they'd get returned or they'd go to someone's house. Um, a voter has to be proactive to remove themselves or have a court action or something like that. The process of removing them without their, quote, signature, but through the federal approved process, wasn't done since 2009 until recently. So hopefully those people that are getting multiple postcards to their houses of people that may not or don't live there anymore, they will be removed through this list maintenance process. And I haven't received any of those postcards. I should say, and I'm Representative Graham, don't listen to me here. I'm not too upset because I get... I get all the mails that say I don't like puppies and all that kind of stuff because the guy I bought it from was a Democrat. Yeah. So I get all their hit pieces on me. So I kind of know, I kind of know, whoa, I don't like puppies this week, whatever it is. But anyway, <laughs> so, so anyway, the point is I make, I'm making light of it, but, and I don't think, and I do think we have controls in place to make sure that this gentleman doesn't vote, even though he no longer, no longer lives in Kentucky, presumably, but it does open up the opportunity for fraud. And so whatever we need to do, whatever expedition, expeditious uh, operations we need, we need to do that. Thank we, you, Mr. Chairman. If I may state something else, when we do find out somebody like a homeowner calls or we have information, the State Board of Elections does send out a letter to that voter and tries to get them to remove themselves. If we have a new address for them where they may have moved, that is, it just doesn't, people don't mail. I mean, 
people don't use mail the way they used to. I will say, Representative Nemus, one of the other reasons that somebody might get mail at your address, we do have overseas citizens that may have last lived at your address. It's not common. It shouldn't happen that much. But by Kentucky and federal law, that person can still say they're registered in Kentucky and they have to give that address. So that doesn't happen all the time, but that's one of them. Okay. The last three questions, four questions here are, need to be quick. Senator Nemus. Uh, yes. The reason you have to send out and get them to get their self off the ballot is that state or federal law, state or federal constitution. For instance, if it wasn't a law that you had to do that, it would be easy to say if they sold the house, they're automatically off the rolls. Federal law. In Kentucky law follows the federal law um but you federal law prevents us and federal lawsuits that have been litigated through you cannot just remove someone right have to have a signature representative graham uh, are yes. the states coordinating with the, are each uh, the 50 states coordinate with uh, each other in regards to so there's no way in which you can find out if someone's in Indiana who used to live in Kentucky and vice versa. The best way to do that is to encourage states to join ERIC, okay. the Electronic Registration Information Center. Okay. Um, I will say Indiana currently is not a member, and we hope we can encourage them to join. Well, I would hope all the surrounding states would be. I, I, I just want to make a comment. What I have seen today is that our election process, as I said earlier, are secure and safe. And I, I, I was just looking at um, uh, Mr. Gantley, uh, your presentation with HARP uh, and going through it and seeing that you have over 20 states in which you are uh, engaged in, in terms of the process of voting, which based on my uh, mathematics, and I was a history teacher, not a math teacher, that's 40% of the states that you, your organization is involved in. And I don't know uh, about the other system, E, S, and S, how many states, I think you all may have said it, but I didn't jot it down. The point being is that you are both uh, engaged in the election process. You've, you've got the experience of securing the voting machines that we all use uh, within those states. And having that many states, that should tell us that our election process is secure and that we need to verify and let the people of the Commonwealth, but more importantly, across the country know that when you go vote, your vote is counted, your vote is significant, your vote helps to determine who will lead not only your local government, your county government, your state government, and more importantly, our national government. So I'm here to just say to all, uh, to both uh, organizations, companies, thank you for what you do, and thank you for coming before us today to, to verify, which we all really know this, that our election process is free, but it's also secure. So thank you so much. Co-Chair Bratcher has a question. <laughs> Uh, just uh, expert on Eric. Is there? Would you consider yourself an expert on Eric? No, I would not consider myself. Is an there expert. anybody in the room? I, I feel fairly secure in it. Um, I will say that when I was at State Board of Elections and we entered into the de consent decree, part of the consent decree is that we join Eric or a like organization. So, if I ask this question, does Eric do any? the process of Eric or whatever, does it do any encouraging of um, uh, registering to people to vote? It does as part of, it sends out a list to the states once they are requested. And it's actually part of the membership agreement that they send it out every, at least every two years. But they send out notices to unregistered but eligible voters. They did, I think, a State Board of Elections sent this first one out in 2020, um, and then they'll send another one out at some point. Um, but it dwindles as after the first one goes off. So they won't send it to the same people. It would be new persons that have come that are now eligible. So and they won't, why do they do that? 
You know, I think probably, and this is me with conjecture, um, I think when Eric was formed, they probably tried to find ways to make both political parties happy. Trey, mm -hmm. Trey says yes. Is Trey, Trey, do you work for Eric? Or <laughs> do you, I mean, do you speak for him, I should say? No, I didn't know that. Who, who who would we talk to that oh go ahead no I was just I was in office when Eric was created Trey Grayson former secretary mm -hmm. um no I was in office when Eric was created and so the idea was you get two lists one of people who might be in your, might appear to be in your state but aren't don't appear to register people who are registered who don't appear to be in your state and then the states have to do something with those lists and that was the states worked out that agreement to do both clean up the list and also expand the voter franchise. There's an executive director that the state, the states have a board of directors and they have an executive director and we could put you in contact with him and he can answer any questions you have about Eric. But the, the idea is you send a letter or a card or something to the folks who might be eligible to be registered. They don't automatically get registered. Right, and we did send that card out in February. We have deadlines that we meet as a member of Eric and that particular card went out as our deadline was, I believe, February 16th. And, you, and it you, did go out. Just timely. to be clear, you feel that that's part of your mission is to go out and reach out to people to register? Well, it's part of the ERIC required. membership agreement okay. process. It's part of what we've agreed to do. So, And if I could just do one more, uh, Chair, thanks for your patience. Uh, there, this is my understanding, totally different subject. This is my understanding of early reporting people were complaining that they weren't getting the election results this past election quick enough here's my understanding you tell me where i'm wrong before there used to be like a third party vendor that that clerks or whatnot would send send the info out to go address the media and whatnot somebody somewhere screwed it up on the tv screen uh, reversed like uh, Matt Bevin's situation, I think it was, and that's really kind of what started the whole, the whole conspiracy thing. Now, my understanding is that those that information that was sent to that vendor was not official in the least. Right, that was not official, and if I may, I will let you know that uh, we no longer contract with. That and that's service. why our results are so slow, right? Well, and well, I don't. Uh, well, <laughs> we're hoping it'll be a little faster in November. The re so, and the reality is, the results that you're seeing on, and there was an AP story today talking about the 2019 governor's race and saying th this is a ridiculous statement. This was fat fingered by by somebody that went to Henderson County to get the results off the precinct's doors that switched the numbers switch the numbers it wasn't somebody got votes taken away it was fat fingering the the reality is these these news stations these media stations typically don't get their information from the state board of elections election night reporting site they get it because they have runners that go to every one of these precincts because kentucky requires the precinct results to be posted on that door so they're not getting it from us, they're getting it from the doors and then they're texting it into their newsrooms and that's how they're getting the results. This isn't, how many people have made a mistake by entering numbers backwards? I mean. Well, they can get it quicker by going to the doors of the precinct. Absolutely. Uh, if, if, I mean, I know you're trying to end the meeting center mills, but I can talk a little bit more about the history of this election night system. If, mm -hmm. Just John, a little bit. Yeah, my predecessor, John Brown, created a system with the State Board of Elections and it was actually hand keyed and it was only this the General Assembly, basically candidates have filed in the Secretary of State's office. And you would, in the county clerks at each night when they were done, hand keyed the results from each precinct into a computer. And that was actually fairly inaccurate. I remember one night um, where a Senate race was reversed because there was a typo, uh, you might remember, or it was a state rep, Brandon Smith, remember how we thought mm -hmm. he lost one year, yeah. ended up winning? It was a typo of unofficial results on election night. So in 2010, the state entered into a contract with a vendor that was able to take the data from the voting systems on a card, plug it into another machine, and then it got uploaded to the internet. And that, that's when we could get all of the county races in there as well. And those were not keyed in. So that was accurate. But again, it was generally at the end of the night. Um, most media outlets do have stringers out in the polling places or they'll go to the county clerk's office because they can get the results quicker. 
Um, then what happened is that that kind of, that vendor went out of business, so the state board had to create its own. You had to. Well, they didn't actually go. You got out you of renew it. the contract. I think is what. Right. We were we did not renew the contract yeah. with that company, and the state board of elections made the conscious decision for us to create our own election night reporting system, just as our voter registration system. We don't have an outside vendor, so now we are our election night reporting vendor, which will clearly make, should hopefully make the public feel more secure about our election, that it, it's coming to us and we are reporting it. And I apologize for the, uh, the little bit of the delay. It was new, a new system. We had tested, tested, tested. I think we had a few glitches right there about five minutes till. But our team is working and making sure that it is more enhanced come November. Well, I think that so. the delay is okay. Just let's watch any false results because you see what can happen. Now, I was a big supporter of Bevin right up to the election night. And I wrote a big article in the Courier Journal supporting him like a week before the election. And the Democrats are still using that against me every election. <laughs> And because uh, my district did not vote for Matt Bevin, they're using that all the time. My point being, if I, because because at first I was concerned about that those rumors, and I can tell you, if I, and I and I looked into it, and I, I went to many people and and discussed it. If I thought for a minute that something like what is being accused of happened, I wouldn't shut up. Nobody's known me to shut up. I, I would be still yelling about it. But it, but it, I understood the problem, and it was just a matter of reporting. Mm -hmm. And to have the things that are being said across the state happening, you'd have to have so many people involved with that conspiracy. There's no way you would keep everybody quiet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I don't mind the delay. Let's just make sure they're 100% accurate before they're released. That's just my opinion. Thank you all. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very quickly. Um, and you may have said this earlier, but how is the county level election results data communicated to the state board? It is the information. The information from the counties is certified to the secretary of state sent to us. Um, it's faxed to us, signed by all of the um, county board of elections. Faxed to faxed. you? So there's no connectivity anywhere well and then they mail the original all right but there's no computer connectivity in that process no. okay thank you mr chairman our final question is senator thayer thank you mr chairman first of all i want to echo representative nemus i have great concern about the super precincts and so while i have the attention of the clerks and the board of elections uh, i'm going to say please don't abuse it if you spread these things out too much it disenfranchises rural voters. And if we continue to see a pattern like that, I'll sponsor the bill myself to eliminate them and go back to the old way, which I still prefer. I understand the need, but please, clerks, be very judicious in the decisions and board of elections. Please be contemplative when you look at the, the plans and review them. Secondly, I'm going to surprise everyone and agree with Representative Graham. I agree with him. I think in Kentucky that our elections are secure and safe. And I think today's testimony has proven that. Now, I can't speak to other states where there have been widespread allegations, but I think here in Kentucky, our elections are very safe. And I've been in this body longer than anyone on this committee, I think. I've been through a lot of elections, dealt with a lot of election law in this committee right from day one. And I think it's good to ask questions. But I feel pretty good about the state of our elections here. And spreading disinformation about the electoral process is not good for our republic. It depresses voter turnout. Just look at the Georgia runoff elections when people thought that their votes didn't count. And look what happened. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask a question. I'd like both of the companies to come forward. There have been allegations made about, and this gets back to Representative Bratcher's question, but I'm going to be a little more specific. There have been allegations made about the ability of the machines to quote unquote switch votes. So I'm going to ask both of you, is there any evidence 
that any of our machines have been tampered with by an outside entity looking to change the results of Kentucky elections? No, sir. No, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Well, thank you so much. I know there's been a lot of effort uh, put into this meeting, equipment brought in, folks come in from out of town, and I thank you for your honest input and uh, firsthand information on our voting machines. I would encourage members to uh, take a look at these this equipment that is here, and uh, we'll remind members that our next meeting is actually at the Kentucky State Fair on August the 25th. So if there's no other questions or comments, we stand adjourned. Thank you.